Good day, everybody. Just know what I'm trying to call it physics here. What is this? Oh, we've seen some of this stuff before, right? We've got some springs. Some springs. Great. Well, we've looked at the spring force, right? I pull this down, the spring force is back up. Good. These aren't compressible in this state, but hey, we've got a couple springs. We've got a green one, and we got a blue one. And I can take some mass hangers here. And I can attach these mass hangers, maybe. I can. I can do it. And I can go ahead and note that this one's a little bit lower than, than the other one, but not that much, right? Not that much at all. So that's because this is tilty, but that's okay. This one stretched a little bit. This one didn't really stretch yet. I'm going to add 500 grams of mass to each of these on top of the mass hanger. And then this. So I ask you this, which one stretched more? And you will tell me the blue one did, right? Nah, blue one did because this mass is down further. So which spring has a greater spring constant? And the spring constant gives us the aspect of how much force per unit displacement. This one and this one both have the same amount of force acting on the springs pulling them downward. Just mg here. This one doesn't stretch as much. This one has a greater spring constant. That's it. Is it a whole bunch more? Eh, probably not, but it's different. Different spring constants. So great, we've looked at spring forces, spring constants, and such. What we want to look now is at oscillations. What happens if I lift this up a little bit and I let go of it? Ooh, it goes up and down. Look at that. It keeps just doing the same thing over and over, up and down, and 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 up and down. And it starts swaying back and forth a little bit. We're just mostly concerned with this up and down motion. What's going to happen with this one if I do the same thing? goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, just like this one did. What happens if I lift them both up and let go of both of them? Well, they'll both go up and down, right? Let's look. Oh, they do. Uh-oh, but one goes faster than the other, up and down faster. And we start getting a little coupled oscillations, but okay, which one oscillates faster? This one does. This one's going up, down, up, down, up, down. And this one's going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Faster, faster, faster. They both have the same masses attached to them, but they oscillate at different rates. Hmm, what could possibly be the, the cause of that, that, that different oscillation? And well, you may say, hey, the spring constants. Spring constants are different. And I'd say, hey, that makes sense. Different spring constants, different oscillations. At the same spring constant, they should probably oscillate at the same rate, right? That would stand the reason. Let me grab something really quick. Another little set here, shall we? What happens if I replace this one with another blue one? And assume that this blue one has the same spring constant as this one, which they should within reason. And I let go of them. Oh, look at it. They oscillate at the same rate, right? What happens if I do one just a little bit and one a lot more? They both still go up and down at the same rate. This one starts swinging a little bit much. So what I just want to demonstrate with that is that it doesn't have to do with how far it's moving because they still oscillate at the same rate. This one just moving a greater distance, but they still go up and down at the same time whether they have the same overall displacements or whether one's small and one's large. They stay in sync because they have the same spring constant and the same masses attached to them. So those are two things that we could sort of play around with. We just saw that changing the spring constant definitely changes the rate of the oscillation. The greater the spring constant, it seems, the faster it oscillates for a given amount of mass attached to the spring. What happens if I start increasing the mass attached to the spring? Can I make this one go slower than this one? Well, let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead and take 200 grams of mass here. Add it on, and the spring elongates a little bit more, stretches a little bit more because there's more force. Now we have different masses. 
but different spring constants too. What happens? This one's still going a little faster. Let me add on a little bit more. Try this out. Ooh, they're pretty close now. Not exactly the same, but hopefully you can get the idea that, hey, there's a particular mass that I could have on this one that would get them to oscillate at the same rate. That's really close now. It's not exactly the same, but what have I done? I've slowed this one down. How did I slow it down? I added more mass to it. So those are the two things that can affect the oscillatory motion of these objects, is the mass and the spring constant. And what this is known as is simple harmonic motion. And this is a simple harmonic oscillator. It oscillates in what is known as simple harmonic motion, as we'll see in the mathematical description of it. But ultimately, it's really important, a really important um, system in physics to study. And it's, it's cool because there's not much to it. The system just does the same thing over and over. And if you want to oscillate at different rates, you can do one of two things change spring constants or change the mass attached to the spring. So, when you start analyzing the system, there's going to be a couple things that we need to account for. One of them is the spring force. One of the gravitational force too. Now, it turns out that the gravitational force is already absorbed into the system. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all regarding the oscillations because of this. When I have this spring like this, it is at its natural length. When I stick this mass onto it and let it come down, I can consider this a new equilibrium position for the spring. When the spring here, or the mass here, is stationary, the spring force up is equal to the gravitational force down. The gravitational force is constant, but the spring force is not. So right now, gravity is totally absorbed into the system, such that the net force is equal to zero. So we could call this like an equilibrium position for this spring now. And what can we do? Well, if I lift it up, what am I doing? I'm actually compressing the spring now. The spring is compressed relative to this equilibrium position. So it doesn't fall downward because gravity is pulling it down at this point. It falls downward because the spring is considered to be compressed and the spring force pushes it downward. And then what happens when it's down here? Well, when it's down here, the spring force is upward, back towards the equilibrium position and it pulls it up. So in this particular case, what we have even though it's suspended, Gravity is not a factor here. If I had a spring that was compressible and was able to undergo elongations as well, and I turned this system horizontally and had maybe like a frictionless surface, we could <clears throat> displace the mass by some amount relative to the equilibrium position of the spring and have the mass go like this. And if it was a spring with this spring constant and this was the mass attached to it, it would oscillate in the same exact manner except it would just be horizontal. Same exact rate, because gravity doesn't matter. So this is a nice system to study because it's the spring force that's wholly responsible for the changes in motion of the object. The key with this is that the spring force varies with respect to position, and thus varies with respect to time as this object oscillates up and down. There's lots of little things going on that we can take a look at, like, hey, how's the velocity changing with respect to time? How's the position changing with respect to time? How's the acceleration changing with respect to time? Or how are those changing with respect to position, the velocity and the acceleration? So this is what we want to look at now, the simple harmonic oscillator. And this is a special one, the mass spring system. There's other types of simple harmonic oscillators. This is specifically the one that we want to look at. Mass spring system, simple harmonic oscillator. All right, so let me get a few things out of the way and we'll start kind of looking at that. All right, cool, be right back. All right, so here we go with some simple harmonic oscillations. So, <clears throat> Want to start off with getting some expressions for it, right? So, mass spring. Let's 
system in which spring force is only force producing changes in motion. What do we have with this? So we're going to call this simple harmonic oscillator. Thing responsible for changes in motion regarding the object, what do we have? Well, we have that the net force is equal to the spring force then, right? Force that the spring exerts. And we know for a linear spring, F sub S hat is equal to negative K X hat. X hat is the position relative to the equilibrium position. K is the spring constant. And this has to do with the directionality regarding the displacement and the spring force directionally. So again, the spring force is always back towards equilibrium. That's what that minus sign ultimately gives us. So this is a good place to start off here. What can we do with this? Well, we know that the net force produces the acceleration of the mass as well, right? force produces the acceleration of the mass. So what do we have with this? Well, from these two, we've got ourselves that m a hat is equal to negative k x hat, which we can then solve for the acceleration, giving a hat is equal to negative k x hat divided by m. There's the acceleration as a function of position. And there's some nice things that we can look at. Like, hey, what's the acceleration of the object as the mass transits through the equilibrium position of the system? And what well, equilibrium position is correlated with x is equal to zero, and that would give us that a is equal to zero. There is no acceleration as it goes through equilibrium position because the spring force is zero at equilibrium. There we go. Where's the spring force of maximum at? Well, It'd be a maximum where the object, the mass, is the furthest away from equilibrium. Those are the turning points. We'll get into some other correlations with that. But if nothing else, this is a nice expression that gives us, again, acceleration as a function of position. All right, so what can we do with that? Well, besides just understanding the correlation between those two, we can actually do a whole bunch. So, <clears throat> we can either use calculus or we could use magic. So, let us do some. So, the magic. Magic gives us the displacement of the mass with respect to time. X of t is equal to a times the cosine of. Omega t, where a is equal to the amplitude of the oscillation, which is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. rate at which they occur. So <clears throat> if 
used omega before for angular velocity. It's much like that. Um, we use that for rotational motion, but we don't call it angular velocity because it's not really going in a circle. It's going up and down, but it repeats itself every two pi radians. So we call it angular frequency. Well, this omega is in a sense controlled by the spring constant of the spring and the mass that's attached to it. And omega is equal to the square root of k over n. So this equation right here works under the assumption here, x of t is equal to a at t is equal to zero. So when we start the system according to this expression right here, we put in t is equal to zero, cosine of zero is equal to one, and we are x is equal to a. So we're starting with the mass at a positive displacement, positive maximal displacement relative to the equilibrium position. And then from time t equals zero, time goes on and follows, follows this as position with respect to time. This comes from considering the varying acceleration with respect to position and thus with respect to time and using some calculus to derive it, um, which we go forgo in this class, but most other classes we don't. Anyways, <clears throat> there we go. And what else do we get? Well, from this we can also get the velocity and the acceleration with respect to time. Velocity. We've got b of t. Well, that turns out to be negative a omega sine of omega t. And we've got acceleration. a of t is equal to negative a omega squared cosine of omega t. And that's what we end up getting with respect to these uh, the equations of motion regarding the simple harmonic oscillator, mass spring system. All right. So what we want to do is start looking at some other aspects of, of that. And we'll do just that. So let me magically disappear and reappear momentarily. Let's look. We're going to let phi be equal to zero. So phase constant is equal to zero in this case. And that just gives us that x of t is equal to a times the cosine of omega t. Then. There we go. So let us plot this out. Well, we got ourselves this and will be A, this will be a negative A there, and the two above, two below those should be equal, but it's okay. And then we draw our cosine function here. So cosine starts up here, and it just keeps on going like this, right? So what do we have with this? Well, this is here, x of t, and this is the time axis. This is the variation of the position of the object with respect to time given the phase constant is equal to zero. How does it start? It starts out positively displaced from the equilibrium position by its maximum amount, a. It's released, what does it do? It travels back towards equilibrium. This is x is equal to zero right here, goes through the equilibrium position, and then goes down the same distance that it was up initially. And then what does it do? It turns around. It turns around and goes back up, then goes down, then goes up, then goes down, then goes up, then goes down. Don't get the idea that it's moving to the side here, flowing like this. This is just describing the variation in position with respect to time. This is all that it's doing. I could grab a little spring here. Let me get a slinky spring. One moment. It's a little bit easier to work with. And whew. what do we do? Hope we can say, hey, 
Here's the equilibrium position right here. I can lift it up above the equilibrium position some distance A and let go of it. What does it do? It oscillates up and down, up and down, up and down. And this is the function or the graph that represents the variation position with respect to time. Now actually, we can produce this cosine function by having this oscillate up and down and move to the right. So watch this, kind of traces out, watch the mass. So I'm gonna have going up and down, and then I start walking to the right. What does it do? It traces out a cosine wave. So I'll do it going the other way, it doesn't matter. As long as I walk at a constant rate, it does this. Up and down, up and down. But really, we just want to keep it stationary and just know it's not moving to the right or to the left if it's um, a vertical oscillator. It's just going up and down. There it is. Well, let us think about a couple things with this here. Well, it's starting the maximum displacement above the equilibrium position. When's the next time that it's actually here? Well, that would be right here, right? If we start there, and it ends up back where it was in the same state, that's one full cycle. One full cycle. That's how we define cycles. The cyclic process goes through the same motion over and over, or the same scenario over and over. When it goes through one full repetition, that's one cycle. So there's one full cycle. It's gone down and back up to where it initially started. Well, how long does that take? Well, in terms of the function, when are we going to be there? We'll be here. Omega t is equal to 2 pi radians. Because cosine repeats itself every 2 pi radians, right? Start at 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi. Every 2 pi that goes by has gone through one cycle, every 2 pi radians. This argument goes in intervals of 2 pi. So when omega t is equal to 2 pi, it will have gone from where it initially was and advance itself one full repetition. So what does that give us? The time then is two pi divided by omega. So hmm, let's look at this. This time to complete one full cycle is called a period. We use capital T for the period. So we write capital T is equal to 2 pi divided by omega. And there it is. There's the period of the oscillations. Well, what's omega for a simple harmonic oscillator that's a mass spring system? Omega is equal to the square root of k over m. So for the mass spring system, this is equal to 2 pi multiplied by the square root of m over k. Because it's divided by omega, we can write it like this. So the time it takes the oscillator to produce or go through one full cycle is dictated by the mass attached and the spring constant of the spring. Well, those two things were responsible for how fast it goes up and down, right? Yeah. So. They have to be responsible then for the time it takes to complete one full cycle. The larger the mass is, the more time it takes to do one cycle. The slower on average it's moving. The greater the spring constant, the smaller the period, the less time it takes to complete one full cycle, the faster it must be moving on average. So that's what we've got. So it's related directly to this omega here. And that's why we call omega angular frequency because it's related to period by 2 pi.
pretty cool, pretty cool indeed. So this is important. Notice something about this. See the amplitude in there anywhere? Does not depend on the amplitude. And we showed that to be a little small oscillation or a large oscillation. And whew, that's hard to do with a small and a large. Whew. Anyways, if it's the same mass and the same spring constant for the system, the amplitude of the oscillation doesn't matter. The time it takes to complete one full cycle is wholly dictated by the mass and the spring constant. So whether it's going like this, really, really big distances, or it's going like this, really small distances, for one mass and one spring constant, it's the same. So that's pretty cool. That is indicative of simple harmonic motion. It's one of the key um, aspects of simple harmonic motion, independence of the period with respect to the amplitude of the oscillations. All right. So whew, there's more of this. We can also define the frequency of the oscillations. cycles per second, which are called hertz, HC. So one cycle per second is called one hertz. That's it. So what we can do with this for the simple harmonic oscillator is set the frequency. Frequency F is equal to one divided by the period. You've got cycles per second for the frequency and period is seconds per cycle. How much time it takes to complete one cycle. So they're inverses of one another. And for the simple harmonic oscillator mass spring system, we just have the inverse of this, which then gives us that's equivalent to omega over two pi. So that's how the frequency is correlated with annular frequency. And then we've got that that is equivalent to 1 divided by 2 pi times the square root of k over n. So again, the linear frequency in hertz um, is related back to the spring constant and the mass attached to the spring. All right. So there's some nice things regarding the the position with respect to time that we can extract out period, frequency, understand the angular frequency a little bit. And what else can we do if we want to be looking at the velocity and accelerations with respect to time as well? So let's go ahead and do that. Put this one up. This one down. Move on. So let us also look at the velocity and the acceleration with respect to time graphically and make some other determinations regarding those particulars. So let me do this. I'm going to redraw out x of t, so we've got time. And then we got x of t. We'll draw another one. It's going to be time and let's put it right there. So it's going to be v of t. this is going to be A of T. So we've got the same time axis for everything. 
And what we're going to do is plot out these different coins here. So again, x of t, get starting with maximum displacement at t is equal to zero. So this would be x is equal to a. Say, just go ahead and put these in, guys. Starting here. There we go. Something that's supposed to look sinusoidal. It does. This is a little off, but that's okay. And then we can start putting in velocity. So, what about the amplitude of the velocity? The amplitude of the velocity is not the same as the amplitude for position. The amplitude of the velocity goes with the maximum and minimum, really, plus or minus the maximum speed of the object. So what's the maximum and minimum speed? Well, again, we've got that this is equal to x of t is equal to a times the cosine of omega t. V of t is equal to negative a omega sine of omega t. And for this last one, a of t is equal to negative a omega squared cosine of omega t. So cosine omega t, sine omega t, and cosine omega t again, those just vary between one and negative one. The maximum values plus or minus is going to be whatever's out in front. For position, it's plus or minus a. That's the amplitude. For the velocity, it's plus or minus a omega. That's the maximum speed. And for the acceleration, it's plus or minus a omega squared. It's the maximum acceleration. So in this particular case, we've got that this is a omega, and this is minus a omega. Maximum speed, either going in the positive direction or in the negative direction, up or down, or to the right or to the left, depending on how we're characterizing things. And this one we'll do purple again. And this is a omega squared, negative a omega squared. All right, so we got this plotted out. Now we want to plot out the velocity and accelerations. These pins up, so don't lose them. So what do we do with this? Well, we're plotting negative sine function that varies between a omega and negative a omega. So negative sine, well negative sine starts here, and it goes down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up. But there's a direct correlation with respect to what we have in this graph and what we have in terms of the velocity. So at t equals zero, well, this is where we are. Right there. The velocity is equal to zero. And then this object, we're assuming that we're starting to get at the positive a, it starts going down towards equilibrium in the negative direction. So this is going negative direction, and eventually it reaches its maximum speed. Its maximum speed is going to be when it actually goes through the equilibrium position. So for this, it's going to go down, get to the equilibrium position, speeding up, and then it's going to proceed to slow back down until it reaches the point negative a, at which time the velocity is zero, because ooh, it slows down, and then what does it do? It starts going up. It starts going up, eventually it has a maximum speed upward, going through the equilibrium position again, and then comes to the maximum displacement in the x direction above equilibrium, and that's where it's going to come to a stop again. And then it just repeats. So it goes down, speeds up, then slows down, and then starts going up, speeds up, slows down, and then it again repeats. There, there. So I gotta put those in for guides for myself, but I'm gonna try to draw this in smoothly. T 
generally can't do it just because I'm not that talented. That's supposed to be sinusoidal, but it should be a little bit smoother. But this is how the velocity varies with respect to time. And then for the acceleration, we've got the same sort of thing going on that we had for the displacement, except we've got negative cosine. So we're starting here. And what do we do? Well, we start there and we accelerate. We accelerate, but it's got to slowing down. Slow down until there's a zero acceleration. Excuse me. Decrease the acceleration. We're still speeding up, but the rate at which we're changing our acceleration is decreasing. Until there's no acceleration, that's when we have the maximum velocity, and then we start getting the maximum acceleration in the other direction. That's when we're back at the turning point, and we're at x is equal to negative a. This is what we have. Again, this is all happening at the same time. So this object starts at its maximum displacement and starts going down, down towards the equilibrium position, and then continues to go down until it's the maximum displacement in the opposite, um, on the opposite side of the equilibrium position. Well, this is what it does. The velocity starts at zero, and then the velocity gets larger and larger, but negative because it's going down. So anytime the velocity is below this axis right here, that's saying that the object is moving downward. Moving down. So it's moving down, it's speeding up as it moves down. Right here it passes through the equilibrium position. Equilibrium, equilibrium. And then, it's still moving down, but it starts to slow down. Now it's slowing down until its velocity is zero. So that's when it's gone through equilibrium, and then it's coming back down to a stop, so it can turn around and do the same thing over again. And that's seen in the acceleration. The acceleration's negative, it's increasing its speed downward until it passes through the equilibrium position, then the direction of the acceleration changes to positive, slowing the object down. Object's still moving downward, acceleration's in the opposite direction, object's coming to a stop. Object stops, and then starts going up. When it's going up, it is increasing its speed. It has a positive acceleration, moving in a positive direction, increasing its speed until it goes through again the equilibrium position, at which time it has its maximum speed, at which time the acceleration is <coughs> at zero, no acceleration as it goes through the equilibrium position, and then it just keeps on going with this. So maybe it's a little confusing looking at all these graphs. So it's three different things looking at the same time. But this is how the motion ultimately goes. So what we want to do with this is kind of draw it out so we can see sort of a step-by-step -step manner of this, at least for one complete cycle. It's a little bit easier to see when it's not just three graphs, so this is what I like to do. So we could say a couple little things just here. Max displacement is x is equal to plus or minus a. 
max speed V is equal to plus or minus A omega and then max acceleration A, let's put a V max here, X max A max is equal to plus or minus A omega squared. This occurs at x is equal to zero. This occurs at x is equal to plus or minus a. At the turning points, that's where the object stopped briefly, but that's also when it has its maximum displacement from equilibrium, such that the maximum force would be exerted on the mass, such that the maximum acceleration is produced. As it goes through equilibrium, that's when it has the maximum speed, but also is when the acceleration is equal to zero. Stops speeding up, passes through equilibrium, then starts slowing down afterwards. Let's draw this out like this. I'm gonna draw it kind of a little step by step, if you will. So we're gonna take something and let's see this. This is gonna be equilibrium position of the system. Equilibrium, a little squiggly in there, but it's okay. And then we're going to do mass, 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 mass. mass. Uh, just a little bit. Mass, 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 Oof. and then mass. All right, so what do we got going on? Let's call this. X is equal to A, which would also be this translates over, X is equal to A, which means that this would be X is equal to minus A. So the object starts here, it's going to go down, then back up. And again, this is kind of looking at a step by step. So we can attach our spring. So there we go. We'll just take, yeah, that's the mass there. It's doing this, goes down, and comes back up. One full cycle, right? One complete cycle, and then what would it do? It would repeat. <clears throat> well, here we have, it's at the maximum displacement from equilibrium. Great. We also have here that V is equal to zero. Stop there. And we have A is equal to negative a omega squared. Negative means a hat is downward, and it's a maximum value. Well, what happens then? Well, it starts going down, right? So now we have that v is downward. v hat is downward. v somewhere in between its maximum value and zero. It's not at its maximum yet, but it's increasing its speed. A is still downward, so the object is speeding up. The acceleration and the velocity are in the same direction. The acceleration here is less than it is here, but it's still accelerating the object until we get right here. V hat is downward. V is equal to negative A omega maximum value and a hat is equal to zero 
No more acceleration because it's at the equilibrium position. The force on it would be equal to zero there. And there we go. It ceases to accelerate. But then it transits through the equilibrium position. Well, what happens then? Well, now what? Now we've got this. The object's still going to be moving down. V hat's downward. It's not going to be this much anymore, though. That's the maximum value downward. It's going to be somewhere in between that and zero. It's slowing down now. When it goes to the equilibrium position, the direction of the force changes to be back towards equilibrium, upward, which means the acceleration is upward now. So now it's decreasing its speed, it's slowing down. Where here it was speeding up. And then what? It reaches the equilibrium position, excuse me, it reaches x is equal to negative a at the maximum displacement. What do we have? Well, we have that v is equal to zero. It briefly stops, it's a turning point in its motion. Stops going down, it's going to start going up. And we also have a hat is equal to, now positive, a omega squared, which is a max, and it's upward. And what? Well, the acceleration continues to be upward, and it starts accelerating it, speeding it up towards the equilibrium position again. So now we have that v hat is upward, <clears throat> a hat is upward and it's speeding up. And then it gets back to the equilibrium position. What's happening here? We have V is equal to a max upward and a hat is equal to zero. No hats on that. It stops accelerating once it gets through, gets to the equilibrium position, and then after it gets through the equilibrium position, the direction of the acceleration changes. So now we've got e hat. It's still going up now, but now a hat is downward, so it's slowing, and then eventually it gets back to the position from which it started, or from which we started here. And what do we have here? We have that V is equal to zero, and A is equal to A omega squared negative A omega squared, which is X. And then we'll repeat. We're back here. Starts going down, comes back up, gets here. Starts going down, comes back up. That's what we've got going on. So. That's kind of how those three graphs correlate in terms of speeding up, slowing down, what position it's at. It's kind of nice to look at. All right, so there's one other nice thing that we want to get out of this and ask you this. Is the spring force a conservative force? Yes, it is, right? We've already looked at that. Spring force is a conservative force. It conserves the total mechanical energy of the system if it is the only force acting. And that's what we have, right? That's what we said at the very beginning. Let the spring force be the only thing that's changing the motion of the object, responsible for changing the motion of the object. So we should definitely have ourselves a conservative system. So let's take a little bit of a look at that, shall we? Definitely. All right. Here we go. Nod your head up and down like a simple harmonic oscillator. And say, I know what's coming. We should have conservation, total mechanical energy, Since the spring force is a conservative force.
factors, and because it's the only thing affecting the motion of the object. So, <clears throat> total energy, total mechanical energy, of the system is this. I'm going to put E total is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to the kinetic energy plus potential energy, right? Well, the mass has the kinetic energy and the spring has the potential energy. And that's something worth, worth noting here. Under all of this the assumption here is that this is a light spring, that the spring itself is massless or of negligible mass, a little bit more realistic, compared to the mass that's attached to it. If that's not the case, it becomes a little bit more complicated because then you've got to take into account the actual motion of the spring, and it's moving in different ways at different locations, having its own kinetic energy that you embed within this. But if we ignore it, simplifies things, um, and it works for, again, light springs or spring masses that are relatively small compared to the mass attached. It's pretty good. So this is of the mass of the mass attached, and this is of the spring. So what can we do with this? Well, this is what we can do. We know kinetic energy is going to be equal to one half m v squared. That's kinetic energy, right? Good. We know the potential energy is equal to one half k x squared. Okay, great. Well, we say that the total energy should be constant. No changes because it's conservative. So, how might it not be? Or is there any changes in energy that are occurring? And the answer is, well, there are changes in energy, changes in the types of energy, but it should be such that the total energy doesn't change. So what types of changes could we have? Well, we have changes in the kinetic energy of the mass and changes in the potential energy of the spring. That's exactly what we have, right? We look at this. The velocity of the mass is changing with respect to time. Sometimes the mass is at rest. Sometimes the mass is going its maximum speed. Sometimes it's in between. So this is varying with respect to time. Well, this is also varying with respect to time. Sometimes the mass is furthest away from equilibrium, at which time the most energy is stored. Springs stretch or compressed by the greatest amount. Sometimes it's at equilibrium. It's at the equilibrium position, at which time it stores no energy. And sometimes it's in between. So both of these quantities here are continuously fluctuating. How do we represent that? Well, we got a V and we got an X. There's a function that describes the velocity with respect to time. And there's a function that describes the position with respect to time relative to the equilibrium position. We've already got those. So this expands out. We have E total can be written as one half multiplied by the mass multiplied by V squared. Well, V is equal to negative A omega sine of omega T. 1 half m v squared. And then we got plus 1 half times k times x squared. Well, x is equal to a times the cosine of omega t. Quantity squared. So there's the total energy of the system at any given time t. But we just said that that should be a constant, right? But we see that we've got terms that are varying with respect to time. Are those going to add together to be a constant? Let's see. Let's see. Let's uh, go ahead and do those squares there and sort of group this all together. So we'll do this. E total is equal to. Well, the negative sign is going to go away because we're squaring this whole term. We'll get an a squared omega squared sine squared of omega t. So let's write this. One half m a squared omega squared sine squared of omega t. Good. And then we'll just get an a squared cosine squared omega t there. So we'll do a plus one half k a squared cosine squared of omega t. 
go. All right, what can we do with this? Well, it may seem like, oh shoot, that looks kind of messy, but there's some nice things in here. One thing that we know is, what's Omega again? Oh, that's right, Omega is the square root of K over N. So, Omega being the square root of K over M says, once again, that Omega squared is just K over N. What happens if we put K over N right there for Omega squared? We got one half m a squared times k over m times the sine squared of omega t plus one half k a squared cosine squared of omega t. M cancels out with that m right there, and we are left with this. The total is equal to one half m a squared k one half m a squared k times the sine squared of omega t plus one half k. So I told you, I said that the m goes away, and then I still do it in there. This m is not there. M cancels out. Uh, one half a squared k sine squared omega t. One half k a squared cosine squared of omega t. Well, one half a squared k is the same thing as one half k a squared. Agreed? Yeah. So what can we do with that? We can factor that term out. We can write this. E total is equal to one half k a squared multiplied by, well, what's that? Sine squared omega t plus cosine squared omega t. Sine squared omega t plus cosine squared omega t what is this equal to? Anybody remember any trig IDs for sine squared plus cosine squared of the same argument? Me too. That's a good one. It's equal to 1. Equals 1 for all time t. It doesn't matter what time. It's the same argument here. Get the value weight of the same. That's always equal to 1. Thus, we have this. The total mechanical energy of the system is then equal to 1 half k a squared. Whew, is that a constant? Yeah, that's a constant. A is the amplitude, k is the spring constant. There we go. There is the constant energy that we assume there should be because the spring force is, is a conservative force. So the last thing that we can do with this is make one more nice equation. And I'll put it right here, and then we can write everything down. And we can say this. The total energy is 1 half kA squared. So 1 half kA squared has to be equal to well, the sum of the kinetic and potential energy, right? So we have, it has to be equal to 1 half mv squared plus 1 half k x squared. Again, this comes from e total is equal to ke plus p. What can we do with this? Well, we can get rid of this factor of 1 half because it's common term in everything. And we can first write this as k a squared is equal to mv squared plus k x squared. And what I'm going to solve this for is I'm going to solve it for v. So I'm going to stick this over on this side, flip it around, then divide by m, and we can write ourselves that v squared is equal to k a squared minus k x squared divided by m. Or we can now say that v is equal to plus or minus the square root of k a squared minus k x squared divided by m. And what do we know? We know that k over m is equal to omega squared. So we've got a k over m and a k over m. Let's separate those terms. Omega squared, a squared minus omega squared x squared. And then we can factor out that omega squared. So in the end, we can write this. V is equal to plus or minus 
omega times the square root of a squared minus x squared. And because we're taking the square root of omega, factor it out, and just get one omega there. This is velocity as a function of position. Velocity as a function of position. X. You tell me where the object is relative to its equilibrium position, we can use this to say how fast it's going. In order to say truly the velocity, we need to know which way it's going. Is it going in the positive direction or in the negative direction? So usually, without more information, the best you can do is say the speed, which would just be the absolute value of this, no plus or minus, just call it plus, because it can be at one displacement, but be going the other way. So for instance, we could have that the objects here going downward with a certain speed, or here going upward with that same speed. If it's at the same displacement, the same displacement from equilibrium, equilibrium position, it will have the same speed, but it could be going up or down. So here, and well, I shouldn't say here and here. This should be down a little bit, but anyways, hopefully you kind of get the point with that. Equilibrium is going the max down. Equilibrium could be going the max up. And do we retrieve anything with equilibrium? Yeah, if we stick in x is equal to zero, that goes to zero. We got the square root of a squared is just a. We get v is equal to plus or minus omega times a, which is the maximum value, right? Going down, it's a omega. Going up, it's plus a omega. There we go. So this ends up being a really useful expression for discerning um, things correlated with position and velocity. So let me do one more thing, just write all these equations down in one spot because there's a lot of stuff that goes with this simple harmonic oscillator. And then we've got it all in one spot. I'm going to add it to a little note sheet for an exam or something. But let's just write it again. All right. So. X of t is equal to a times the cosine of omega times t. V of t is equal to negative a omega times the sine of omega t. And a of t is equal to negative a omega squared cosine of omega t. So we've got the velocity, excuse me, position, velocity, and acceleration as functions of time. And then we've also got that a hat can be written as negative k x hat over m. So there is the acceleration as a function of position. We've also got velocity as a function of position. v is equal to plus or minus omega times the square root of a squared minus x squared. That's good. And we've got some other things like, hey, omega is equal to the square root of k over m. We've got ourselves the period of the oscillations, t, is equal to 2 pi divided by omega, which is an equivalent for the simple harmonic oscillator mass spring system to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. We've got the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the period, which is then omega over 2 pi which is equivalent to 1 divided by 2 pi times the square root of k over m. In period, the time it takes to complete one full cycle, frequency is the number of cycles per second that are um, completed. So we've got those. We've got E total. The total energy of the system is equal to 1 half k a squared. And we note the spring force. I guess that's a general interest, negative k x axis. So those are the main pieces of, these are the expressions that we utilize for this. Um, yeah. If we're using phase constants, we'd add on a plus v here, plus v there, plus v there. Nothing else changes. Cool.
Yes, yes, yes. That's it for this. We'll do a problem, do some problems, and move on. Be well.